Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking a little bit about radial engines. As the name implies, radial engines are circular in shape, with arms or rays extending from a center. Each ray houses a piston. Behind that piston sits a chamber with a spark plug, an intake, and an exhaust valve. The spark plug ignites a fuel mixture in the chamber, pushing that piston down. As the piston returns, the spent gases are expelled, and more fuel is pumped in, and the cycle continues. Each piston is connected to a central hub that attaches to the crankshaft. These kind of engines were incredibly common in the early days of aviation, and it really isn't difficult to figure out why. Their construction is actually quite simple as far as engines go. They're pretty durable as well, being able to take a decent amount of punishment before faltering, and they typically don't need any kind of extensive cooling system attached to them. While there certainly are liquid-cooled radial engines, radials are more well-known for being simply air-cooled. This was achieved by having some kind of heat sink near the end of the ray, and the simple act of air passing over the heat sink in flight kept it cool. No real need for any kind of extensive radiator liquid cooling system. Of course, radials aren't exactly perfect, and they do present a clear problem in drag. Because the rays and heat sinks have to be exposed to the open air, the open flow of air at that, this automatically means that the unaerodynamic rays are going to create quite a lot of drag. On planes that use radials, it's pretty easy to tell as the nose is often flat and open, giving the rays great airflow. This is one of the bigger advantages of inline liquid-cooled engines. The nose can be more aerodynamic and closed. So why are we talking about radial engines? In World War II, Japan was quite attached to them. They didn't really have the manufacturing capabilities or the resources to produce inline engines en masse and they generally preferred the reliability that radials offered. Plus, with radials not needing cooling systems, and thus being lighter, this fit quite perfectly with a lot of their smaller, lighter fighter designs, which in turn often gave them fantastic maneuverability. It's Japan's propensity to use radial engines, and the need for radials to have airflow to cool them, that I want you to keep in mind, when we look at our two subjects for today. Two nearly identical late war designs intended to counter Allied attacks on the Japanese homeland. This is the Manchu Ki-98, and this is the Mitsubishi J-4M. This takes us to the latter half of World War II, around 1944, as the war had turned against the Imperial Japanese and Allied attacks on mainland Japan were ramping up. From the Doolittle Raid in April 1942, that dealt a significant psychological blow to the Japanese military, to slowly increasing aerial raids from early 1944 onward, to the firebombing of Tokyo in March 1945, to the dropping of the atomic bombs that ended the war, as the war progressed, Japan's need for interceptors and high-altitude fighters grew by the day. One such aircraft that was intended to serve as a high-altitude fighter that would take out attacking bombers was the Manchu Ki-98. The Ki-98 didn't actually start as a fighter, though, but rather a few years prior as a sort of multi-role fighter-slash-ground attacker. In mid-1942, the Japanese military was looking for new, potential designs, pretty much anything, really, that would serve as an improvement on planes already in service. The company Manchu, short for Manchuria Airplane Manufacturing Company, created under the control of the Japanese government after the Japanese invasion and takeover of Manchuria, would largely produce other planes under license, but they did have a few designs of their own and one of which was the Ki-98. The design of the Ki-98 was an uncommon one, outfitted with a pusher propeller system and a twin boom tail. Presumably this was done to aid it in being a ground attacker. With the propeller not being in the front, it would give the pilot far better vision. 
sitting under a bubble-style canopy, the pilot would have at his disposal two 20mm cannons and a 37mm cannon, along with, presumably, points under the wings from which to attach bombs and or rockets. Despite being a rather uncommon design, the Japanese military actually accepted it, and Manchu began very slow work on a prototype that extended into 1944. By this point, though, likely due to the increasing prevalence of bombers over Japanese positions and mainland Japan, the more multi-role aspect of the design was ordered to be scrapped, and the Ki-98 was now to exclusively serve as a high-altitude fighter. With its relatively powerful armament, it is safe to assume that it would serve as a bomber-destroyer. Measuring 11.4 meters long, 11.26 meters wide, and 4.29 meters tall, the Ki-98 would be powered by a pretty powerful engine, by Japan's standards, the Mitsubishi Ha-211, or Ha-43, an 18-cylinder radial engine with around 2,200 horsepower. With the Ki-98 being relatively light, all things considered, with an estimated gross weight just under 10,000 pounds, the projected performance was to be upwards of 454 miles an hour at around 30,000 feet. Wind tunnel testing showed the design to be quite promising, and in early 1945, work on a prototype would begin. Running parallel to this design was another design that was to serve the exact same purpose, and it basically had the exact same design, also sporting a pusher propeller system, a twin boom tail, and the same Ha-211 engine, the Mitsubishi J4M, designed in 1944 in response to a call for a new high-powered interceptor, only differed significantly in the dimensions, being slightly larger. Measuring in at 12.98 meters long, 12.49 meters wide, and 3.47 meters tall, the J4M ended up weighing about the same at just under 10,000 pounds, and was also outfitted with two 20mm cannons, but a smaller 30mm cannon complementing it, not a 37mm. Mitsubishi would estimate that the top speed would be upwards of 470 miles an hour. Now, with these two designs, there is a pretty clear problem. Remember that the engine used on both of them was a pretty powerful radial engine, and radials most often need airflow to keep them cool. They could be liquid-cooled, but the Ha-211 was not. So, with the engines being located in the body, behind the cockpit, and pretty covered, the question is this. How exactly would they cool the engines down? Now, you may be saying that the solution was clear looking at the design, with the slots there in the body serving as the air intakes. Now, you are right, but missing something. With the air slots being where they were, the air passing over the body would not be able to sufficiently travel down into them and cool the engine down, and the designers knew that. Those slots on their own would not give them the airflow that they needed. So, on the Ki-98, at least, the proposed solution was actually pretty simple. Not only would the engine be driving the propeller to the rear, but in front of it, behind those air slots, the engine powered a fan that would help suck air in those slots. It's kind of like how your PC cools itself down. Then the air would travel back out from the slots in the rear. Now, would this system lead to any kind of additional drag, or the kind of drag that normal radial engines have? To be honest, I'm not sure. And to be fair, I don't think the Japanese military truly knew either, as neither of these designs would ever fly. The first project to end would be the J4M, as another pusher prop design, the Kyushu J7W Shinden, was believed to be more promising, and it would fill the same role. So it was ordered for work on the J4M to cease, and for Mitsubishi to invest more in a zero-improvement design known as the A7M Repu. Interestingly, even though the J4M never even got past the initial design stages, it would actually still receive an official designation from the Allied Powers. 
it was given the identifying name of Luke. After Allied forces learned of the project in captured documents or intercepted communications, they believed that they would be seeing these planes soon, so they gave it a name. And as for the Key 98, that one would last until just about the end of the war, as Manchu was a rather small entity and would be largely occupied with contracted aircraft, as prototype production began in 1945, by around August 1945, that prototype still hadn't been completed. Most of the parts were completed, at least the important parts of the fuselage, wings, and tail, but they weren't assembled together. Presumably, as well, they still needed to get a HA-211 engine to put on it as well, as that engine too was in its prototype phase. But before they could put it together, though, on August 8th, 1945, two days after the first atomic bomb was dropped but Japan was still in the war, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Knowing that they were screwed and with the Soviets moving in, documentation of the Key 98 and the prototype itself was ordered to be destroyed to prevent their capture thus bringing an abrupt end to Japan's attempts at twin-boom pusher-prop planes. Of the several countries that attempted making these twin-boom pusher-props, with America's XP-54, Sweden's Saab-21, and the Netherlands' S-21, Japan was unique in making theirs with a radial air-cooled engine. All of the others used liquid-cooled engines, probably because the engine sat hidden in the body and it doesn't make a ton of sense to use air-cooled engines in this manner. But with Japan being basically glued to using radial air-cooled engines, they found a way that probably would have worked. But not only did their plane designs not succeed here, neither did the HA-211, with it flying only on the J-7W and the A-7M before the war ended, and the engine project would end then and there. Still, even if Japan had successfully made either of these twin boom planes and they performed as was estimated, it still wouldn't have changed things. I highly doubt that Japan would have been able to produce those planes or those engines in any significant capacity. Japan wasn't just one plane away from turning the tide. Japan needed, like, some kind of holy intervention from the Shinto god Fujin. He's the wind god, and he kind of looks like Blanca from Street Fighter. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Something that's really interesting to me is the accidental convergence of design ideas, when countries and companies just so happen to fall into similar ideas and concepts, like the twin boom design. It's like the engineering version of horseshoe theory. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!